Hello, my name is Daniel Landis. I'm a radiation oncologist at the Swedish Radio Surgery Center, which is part of the Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle. We've created this video for our prostate cancer patients who are preparing to begin CyberKnife treatment. The goal of this video is to go over the many steps involved in the preparation for and the completion of treatment. We'll be creating other videos discussing the selection of CyberKnife as a treatment option for prostate cancer in the future. However, for this video, we wanted to get into the fine details of the day-to-day -day logistics and preparation for the actual CyberKnife prostate treatments. This information will also be mailed or emailed to you. Also, our nursing staff will review by telephone with each patient specific details of their case. For those of you who are still deciding on the best treatment, this video may not be particularly relevant, but we'll provide links below for additional videos as they are created. By now, you'll have met with our team of four radiation oncologists at the Swedish Radio Surgery Center in consultation. I'm Dr. Landis, and you may have also met Dr. Robert Meyer, Dr. Chris Loisel, and Dr. Sandy Vermeulen. If you decided to proceed with CyberKnife, then we've submitted for insurance authorization, and we're working to schedule or have scheduled the first step, which is placement of the gold fiducial markers. There are four main steps in the treatment of CyberKnife for prostate, and we'll review each step in this video. The first is meeting with us in consultation. The second is placement of the gold fiducial markers. The third is the simulation or the planning day. And the fourth is the actual CyberKnife treatments over five days. So the CyberKnife is unique in that it's the only radiation machine that can track real time the motion of the prostate with its robotic arm. In order to track that motion, we need to place gold markers within the prostate. The imaging cameras can then detect each of these markers in real time and adjust to track the prostate. Our office will be setting up a telephone call with you about a week prior to this procedure day for the gold markers. If you haven't heard from us within about a week before, you can call us at 206-320-7130. We will be giving you instructions for the multiple steps involved in preparing for treatment We're reviewing much of the same information which is in this video. For the majority of our patients, we'll be placing the gold markers through our clinic, thus follow the information uh, described. In some cases though, if your urologist is skilled in placement of the markers, their office will be doing the procedure. In that case, please rely on the information from their office rather than below. For beginning five days prior to the procedure, uh, stop taking Coumadin, Warfarin, Aspirin, Ibuprofen, Aleve, or other medications such as Anacin, Excedrin, or Alka-Seltzer. These are all blood thinners and they should be stopped about five days prior to treatment. Tylenol is okay during this time. If you take Eliquis, Xarelto, or Pradaxa, please let us know and contact your cardiologist or the anticoagulation clinic for instructions on how to hold these medications. We can help facilitate this as well. Typically, these need to be held, again, several days prior to the gold fiducial marker uh, placement. They do not need to be held during the simulation and the actual cybernetic treatments. At the time of the nursing phone call, we'll be prescribing an antibiotic as well to be taken the evening before the procedure. At the time of scheduling, we will let you know the location at our First Hill campus for your fiducial marker placement. You will be scheduled at one of two locations at this campus. Prior to the day of the gold marker procedure, don't drink or eat anything after midnight. It's okay to take your medications with a sip of water. If you're diabetic, don't take your usual diabetic uh, medications. Instead, contact your doctor who manages your diabetes to get advice as to how much insulin to take the night before and the morning of the procedure. If you do experience low blood sugar in the morning of the procedure, it's okay to have apple juice or cranberry juice up to two hours prior to the start of the procedure. For the gold fiducial marker placement, administer one fleet enema one to two hours prior to the procedure. These can be found at any pharmacy or at Costco. Often they're in a green box. You'll need these as well for the actual simulation day and the five days of treatment, so it's best to buy a box with multiple fleet enemas. Because we use sedation during the gold fiducial marker placement, the hospital policy requires you to not drive yourself home after the procedure, so please arrange to have a ride home. The hospital also requires that you have a companion with you when you leave, so you can't take a taxi or an Uber home. Form. We have two radiation oncologists at First Hill who are experienced in placing the gold markers, Dr. Steve Yulo and Dr. Daniela Buscariolo. Once the conscious sedation has started, the radiation oncologist will begin the procedure to insert the gold markers. Using ultrasound guidance, 
four markers are placed within the prostate um, through a transperineal approach. This means we're going through the skin of the perineum, not through the rectum like a biopsy. After the fiducial procedure is completed, you could have some minor bleeding, bruising, or discomfort at the insertion site. Extra-shaped Tylenol can be helpful and is usually sufficient to control any pain if you have any. It's okay to resume your regular diet and medications, but we ask you to avoid heavy lifting for the first 48 hours. So now the gold fiducial markers are completed. Now we need to begin the next step, which is the radiation treatment planning, which is also called the simulation. This treatment planning day consists of a CT scan and an MRI scan. This allows us to design, design the radiation fields based on your specific anatomy. We use both the CT and MRI to see details of the prostate, the seminal vesicles, the normal anatomy such as the bowel, the rectum, and the bladder. We can also see the neurovascular bundles surrounding the prostate. The MRI gives us the high quality images that we need for the planning, and the CT gives us the density information to calculate beam energies. Both of these are referenced to those gold fiducial markers. Therefore, these, this procedure has to be conducted after the markers are placed. You'll be given an appointment time for the simulation or planning day. For this, report to the Swedish Radio Surgery Center at Cherry Hill in the A level of the James Tower. Again, this is the same location we met with you in consultation. We'll bring you to the CT scanner, which is located nearby from our clinic. You will also have a separate appointment time for the prostate MRI. Depending on the specifics of your case and the availability, the MRI can either be in the same department as the CT, or at times it's at Seattle Radiology, which is located across the street from First Hill, uh, just a few blocks up from here. Our nurse will review with you again specifics of the location when we have our phone call. It doesn't matter if the MRI of the CT is conducted first or second, because the images will all be fused together on our treatment planning system after the fact. However, for preparation for the simulation day, there are three important steps. First, we recommend beginning a low gas diet one full day prior to your scans. For example, if your scan is 11 o'clock on a Monday, begin the low gas diet on Sunday morning. This is the same diet that will also be used for the actual cyber knife treatments. The goal here is to have as much consistency as possible with your anatomy. It's the same reason we have you do an enema prior to the treatments. If the rectum is full, it will shift the location of the prostate anteriorly. Although the cyber knife can track this motion and adapt to this, it's more difficult and there are more challenges in the treatment itself. Thus, it's ideal to have an empty rectum and as low gas content as reasonably possible. The low gas diet is difficult. I'll cover this more in detail at the end of presentation. Again, the goal here is just to avoid the biggest offending foods. Some gas is normal and to be expected. Try and adhere to the diet for the planning and the treatment, but we understand it's going to be impossible to avoid all the foods listed. Second step, we ask you to administer the fleet enema as was done for the goal of fiducial marker placement. This can be done one to two hours prior to the first scan. You should empty your bladder at the same time as well. This will allow the bladder filling to be fairly consistent in time each day. For most patients, this can be done at home. For those who live far away, there's a bathroom here that can be used or if you prefer, you can do it a few minutes before treatment in our bathroom. Third step, we recommend not eating or drinking anything by mouth for two hours prior to the procedure. Again, minimal water and medications are just fine. The goal here is to minimize peristalsis to avoid needing to repeat the enema procedure. So during the CT simulation, we'll bring you to the CT suite, position you in the exact position that you'll be in for the actual treatment back pain or other orthopedic issues, let our radiation team know so we can make the setup as comfortable as possible. This is the best day to work out any, any issues with developing a comfortable position since it will need to be repeated each day for the five treatments for up to 45 minutes in length. Typically our CT scan does not need IV contrast. We'll however, we will however place a urinary catheter through the urethra into the bladder briefly during one of the scans. This is necessary as it allows us to see the urethra in the images and minimize the dose of this normal structure. When we remove the catheter, you'll leave without it. It will only be in place for about 10 minutes. This is, should not be painful, but it is somewhat uncomfortable. Uh, during the scan, we'll look at the anatomy and we'll be able to confirm that there are minimal rectal contents. If there's a problem with rectal contents or gas, we'll let you know. Sometimes we do have to repeat the enema. 
You'll be assured, though, throughout this whole process, we'll work with you to make sure the position and all the anatomic details are ideal during this day, and that will facilitate making the ideal treatment plan. The MRI is also conducted without contrast. Again, this can be before or after the CT scan. And again, the same uh, guidelines for the enema prior to. So if there's a large time gap between the two scans, you may have to repeat the enema. Some patients cannot have an MRI due to a pacemaker or other metal hardware. And those particular patients will modify the CT scan, possibly adding IV contrast to help image the prostate. As mentioned, the MRI can either be here at Swedish Cherry Hill, the same location as the CT, or at times it's at Seattle Radiology at First Hill. So now the simulation or radiation planning day is done. We will begin working with the design of the actual radiation treatment plan. We'll program the machine with a specific routine or program to treat your prostate based on your particular anatomy. This planning process, identifying the anatomy and developing a plan, typically takes about a week. It's a coordinated effort between the doctor, the physicist, and the radiation treatment team. We will give you an approximate start date prior to the simulation or at the simulation. However, we often will not know the exact treatment time of day until we know how many minutes long will be needed for the actual radiation plan. Each day we're planning multiple patients and building the daily schedule to be as efficient as possible. Often we can't fine tune our daily schedule until the radiation plans are completed, which is often just a couple days prior to treatment. I apologize for this inefficiency. As you can imagine, it's quite difficult to develop a daily schedule when we're working with patients often with severe health issues. We're consistently trying to uh, fine tune and update the schedule as we go. Typically, the prostate treatments are around 35 to 45 minutes in length, and the clinic is open Monday through Friday, essentially during normal business hours. After the simulation day, there are two points to remember. One is we recommend no heavy lifting or strenuous exercise such as mountain biking or CrossFit. Moderate exercise is okay. Two is we recommend avoiding sexual activity that would lead to orgasm. The reason for this is there's at least a theoretical concern that the gold markers could migrate or move from their position. If this were to happen, we would get an error when we placed you on the machine. We would not treat in this case, so there's no chance that we would miss our intended target, but we would measure the distance between each marker in three dimensions and determine that one of them had moved. We've seen this on rare occasion, especially treating cancers other than prostate cancer. In that circumstance, we repeat the planning to adapt to the new location and all will end up working out okay. So now you've completed this radiation treatment planning and you're ready for the final portion of the process, the actual CyberKnife treatments. There are five treatments about 45 minutes in duration. These are Monday through Friday or sometimes every other day or sometimes they're split over a weekend. Often for patients with a large prostate or significant urinary symptoms, we'll elect to treat every other day. For example, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, then the following Monday and Wednesday. This is felt to minimize the urinary symptoms. There are three points of preparation for the final stage of the, the actual cybernetic treatments. There's nothing new here. One is the low gas diet. Second is avoiding eating just prior to treatment and three is the fleet enema prior to the treatment as well. So again, we recommend beginning the low gas diet a full day prior to the treatment. Because there's gonna be about a week between the simulation and beginning the cybernetic treatments, you can go back to your normal diet after the simulation and then begin a day prior to the cybernetic treatments. Uh, second, we recommend the fleet enema one to two hours prior to the treatment. Again, that can be done here in our clinic uh, just before, say 30 minutes before treatment, or it can be done at home if you live locally. If you live far away or prefer, you can do this in our clinic as well. Remember to urinate at this time before treatment as well for consistency. As far as eating, if the treatment time is in the morning, uh, don't eat breakfast. But if your treatment time is in the afternoon, we recommend eating a light breakfast only. If your treatment time is 4 p.m. or later, have a light lunch. When you arrive, check in with our front desk. When it's time for your treatment, a radiation therapist will come get you and set you up on the machine. It's an easy, painless procedure, just like getting a CT scan. Remember, they'll position you exactly as you were at simulation. We play music and we have a camera and a microphone so we can keep an eye on you. If you need to take a break or stop, that's fine, let us know. 
either by speaking or lifting your hand will stop the machine. It can easily be restarted. Our physicists are overseeing the treatment along with our physicians each day. The physicians are available anytime for questions or concerns. We will plan to have a post-treatment office visit set up right after your fifth and final treatment. At that time, we'll review your side effects and also go over the follow-up plan. This is the end of the logistics portion of the video. As, as additional questions come up, we'll add them into the presentation. And now I'll talk briefly about the low gas diet. Also below, we'll have a link to our website which has additional information uh, specific to the diet. In this portion of the video, I'll review our low gas diet recommendations. Again, as mentioned before, we recognize this is quite difficult and there's no way to completely eliminate gas. In addition, there's significant variability when you're reviewing various recommendations of low gas foods. Thus, some of what we recommend may con contradict what we, what we read elsewhere. The goal in minimizing gas is minimize motion of the prostate. So motion is expected and the CyberKnife, again, can com accommodate for this by tracking the gold facial markers. However, if the prostate is in a stable position, treatment proceeds more smoothly, more quickly, and there's less need for correction. As a general rule of thumb, gassy foods are those foods that contain certain types of carbohydrates, soluble fiber, or both. These substances are not fully absorbed in the intestine and instead make their way down to the large intestine where they're uh, set upon by gut bacteria. The byproduct of this process is gas. So in order to avoid gas, try to eat foods that are just the opposite. These are foods that will not be broken down by the intestinal bacteria, so you'd be more safe. Generally speaking, animal proteins are non-gassy. Our bodies are well adapted to digest protein. Sources of protein that come from animals contain no carbohydrates that can be fermented uh, to lead to gas. Because of this, choose any of the foods um, such as beef, chicken, eggs, fish, or turkey. Uh, be careful sometimes glazes or garlic or other things can be added to the uh, meat, so it's best to have it plain. If you choose not to eat animal products, there are other alternatives as well. Um, there are low gas uh, or uh, slightly less gas vegetables, uh, such as bell peppers, bok choy, cucumber, fennel, greens, kale, spinach is an example, lettuce, uh, tomatoes, zucchini. Um, also, some fruits in small amounts are okay. Uh, fruits have a reputation generally of causing gas, and there is a limit to how much your body can normally absorb. Um, but you could have blueberries, cantaloupe, clementine, grapes, honeydew, kiwi, pineapple, raspberries, and strawberries in small amounts. One food that's particularly helpful are fermented foods. In these foods, the bacteria has already taken care of the carbohydrates and has already fermented the food, so there's little to be left to create gas. Um, these are also good for you, generally speaking. These include foods such as uh, fermented vegetables, kefir, kombucha, or yogurt. There's some grains that are uh, less gassy than others. Um, foods that we found to be most helpful include gluten-free bread, rice bread, oats, rice, brown, uh, or white is okay, or quinoa. And there are a few snacks that can be helpful too, such as nuts, um, macadamia, pecans, and walnuts seem particularly good. Um, a small amount of cheese is fine as well. The best cheeses are cheddar, mozzarella, or Swiss. I recognize again that this is quite difficult. Um, any efforts that you take, however, will be uh, incredibly helpful. We recommend, again, beginning this one day prior uh, to the treatment. So if you have a treatment on a Friday and you're returning Monday, you can probably eat a normal diet on Saturday. Thanks again for listening to this video. We're looking forward to seeing you at our center. Again, call us if you have additional questions at 206-320-7130.